This is going to be a short lecture about um, uh, notice and comment rulemaking and specifically about this issue with general statements of policy and interpretive rules. Uh, the casebook that I'm using for my statutory interpretation course uh, has three cases about this. Some semesters I skip two of them. Um, since I'm recording lectures, I thought I would quickly go through the three of them and I'll have a separate lecture for each one. I am going to say this again in future lectures. For my law students, if you're using my statutory interpretation casebook, the, if you were only going to read one case about this, it should be the Hochter case, the Hochter case in your casebook about the guy who raises tigers and lions <clears throat> for a living. Um, why? Because Judge Posner wrote it and it explains all of the issues here um, clearer than um, anyone else ever has, I think. It's a beautiful, beautiful case. Um, if you read through that case slowly, I think this issue will be um, as clear as it possibly uh, could be. So let's, uh, but let's go here and look a little bit. This lecture is not going to discuss any specific cases. We're just going to talk, uh, give the background uh, to this section. So this is 5 USC um, section 553. In other words, this is the Administrative Procedure Act and the section on notice and comment rulemaking, <clears throat> also known as informal rulemaking. So notice first, it says, this is um, what notice and comment rulemaking generally looks like. General notice of proposed rulemaking shall be published in the Federal Register, unless persons subject thereto are named and either personally served or otherwise have actual notice thereof in accordance with the law. In other words, you could, in theory, as an aside, have a very small or consolidated industry with only one or two players um, in it who, so you could make a regulation and there, there's only two companies that you need to tell about it. But generally it's going to be published in the Federal Register. And what will have to be published? A statement of the time, place, and nature of any rule, public rulemaking proceedings, if you're going to have public hearings. Two, a reference to the proposed, to the legal authority under which the rule is, rule is proposed. So that's going to be an enabling statute or other statutes that uh, where Congress, after an agency already exists, gives it more power to enforce something. And then three, either the terms or the substance of the proposed rule or description of the subjects and issues involved. Now, I want my students to pause. One of the cases we always um, <clears throat> do in, in the stat reg class and my administrative law class is uh, Nova, the Nova Scotia food products versus the Food and Drug Administration versus the United States. And in that case, the court uh, it, it found in this language, statutory language, a duty to disclose any scientific studies that the agency had relied on in making its rule and a duty to explain why it chose the rule it did instead of um, possible alternative rules, uh, especially that were proposed by the regulated industry. So now let's move on because this is what um, affects Hochter and the Pacific Gas case and American Mining Companies. Uh, so except when notice or hearing is required by the statute, this does not apply. So these are um, disclaimers or, or uh, um, statute uh, exceptions. To interpretive rules, general statements of policy, or rules of agency, organization, procedure, or practice. Or B, when the agency for a good cause finds and incorporates the finding and a brief statement of reasons, therefore, in the rules issued, the notice and public procedure thereon are impracticable, unnecessary, or contrary to the public interest. You should think of B as the uh, good cause exception or sort of really in practice an emergency exception. So 553B and then capital B is essentially a good cause or um, uh, exception like that. And we have a great example, uh, some great examples while I'm, I'm recording this video during sort of a shutdown uh, due to the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And in that, this case, 
the FDA has been announcing kind of right and left that they are um, authorizing other companies uh, to manufacture ventilators because of a ventilator shortage. They're authorizing exper uh, human trials in experimental vaccines and treatments and, and so forth. And the idea is people are dying and we have to get ahead of this and flatten the curve. And so this is sort of your textbook case of where the FDA and other regulatory public safety organizations are going to um, announce kind of an, an emergency rule or emergency exceptions to the rule to expedite the production, let's say, of vaccines or a treatment during an epidemic. But more um, common, a much bigger issue, and, and I decided I needed to talk about this in some length because it comes up so often nowadays in practice for, uh, for lawyers, is the issue of interpretive rules and general statements of policy. Also keep in mind, if any, a lot of agencies adopt a whole bunch of internal procedural manuals and, 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 um, <clears throat> and employee manuals and so forth that tell, direct their employees how to process cases or how to do their workflow and what decision and, and things like that. And they don't have to publish these out to the outside world, but they do guide the sort of day-to-day -day, um, work process, decision process and workflow or the decision trees, let's say, um, if you think of a decision tree of agency personnel. But the interpretive rules and general statements of policy come up in a lot of cases. And in fact, to give an example, we have litigation going on right now about the ATF's bump stock ban. So after the horrific mass shooting at the Las Vegas, Las Vegas Nevada concert at the end of 2017, um, there was uh, a big push to, to ban bump stocks, which are an accessory or an attachment to a semi-automatic rifle that simulates, it doesn't make it fully automatic, but it enables it to fire very rapidly without the user having the shooter having to pull the trigger manu manually every time so um, it sounds or or behaves more like a um, machine gun um, although uh, gun experts will tell you it's nowhere near as fast as a true machine gun and the the issue in the why does this matter in the bump stock ban case the administration went through notice and comment rulemaking it sure looked like they were adopting a regulation to ban them. But once we were in litigation, um, the administration took the position that it was an, has now taken the, the position it's an interpretive rule, not a new regulation. And so this is a pretty common move for agencies to make as we'll see in the next few cases. Now, uh, this, again, to keep this lecture kind of uh, short and to the point, agencies, can avoid having to do notice and comment or worse, formal rulemaking by characterizing a policy announcement or adoption of a policy or directive as a general statement of policy or as an interpretive rule because you don't, going back, notice you don't have to do notice and comment rulemaking. Um, this section 553 doesn't apply to interpretive rules and general statements of policy. So agencies have if they don't feel like going through the hassle of notice and comment rulemaking, will sometimes just call what they're doing or try to frame it as one of those two things, as an interpretive rule or a general statement of policy. On the other hand, um, characterizing policy directives this way um, also has implications for which type of judicial deference may apply and possibly whether judicial review is even available or the timing of judicial review. So there can be, and we haven't talked about those yet at this point in the course, but keep in mind, there can be a number of complicated strategic reasons um, if the agency is trying to preempt legislation challenging a rule to pretend it's not a rule at all and call it an interpretive rule or a general statement of policy. That's it for our little introductory lecture. And um, our word here is bureaucracy.